Good evening, Stone Ridge Church. It's so good to see you all. You know, sometimes when that music's playing, I think we'll just all sing along with this. It's just such a good jam. But no, we're going to make fresh praise, our own offering to the Lord tonight, and that is special in and of itself. I am delighted and privileged to be doing these songs with you. Um, as we are, I encourage you to worship for God and nothing else. He's the priority. The reason that I'm playing these songs and singing these songs and standing on the stage is because I believe that God can use it to bring glory to his name and to share the gospel. And for those of you who are joining us from all different places, from living rooms and cars and cell phones, I am so glad that you are with us in spirit right now. Join us in this worship. Let it fill the place you're in and let the presence of God minister to your heart. Would you stand and join us as we give our God praise this morning? Or morning. I did it again. Afternoon. seat. It is a great day to be worshiping at Stone Ridge Church. Amen? Amen? Because no matter what day it is, we can always celebrate the resurrection. So even though we're a week out from Easter, it is still a resurrection day because Jesus lives and lives every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we get to be here to worship and praise him. So thank you for choosing today to join us right here in this time of worship. If you are new with us, 
You are so welcome here. We are glad that you are here. We would love to be able to connect with you. Very simply done. You can pull out your phone, text the word hello to 928-248-8778. It'll send you back just a quick form. You can tell us uh, your email, your phone, ways for us to help you out. You can ask questions through that number as well. Also, it is a great way to connect with our prayer ministry. So if you put in the word prayer and send it to that same number, 928-248-8778, we have an incredible group of prayer partners that take those prayers during the week and they pray over them. And they ask God to intercede on the very behalf of what you're asking for. And so we would love to, to partner with you in prayer. And that's why they call them prayer partners. And you can do that right through our uh, texting number as well. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we walk into prayer. Or as we walk into worship. We're going to walk into prayer too. I actually hope we run into prayer. That's, that's the more appropriate word, right? We're going to run into prayer. Holy Spirit, I, I want to run right into you right now. I want to run into your arms. I want to feel your presence. I want you to fill this room right now, in this very moment. Come, Holy Spirit. Bring more and more and more of you in here. I want you to sit down by every person tonight, Father, and I want you to whisper into their ear how much they are loved by you. To tell them that the God of the universe, the God that created the stars and the, and the moons, placed them in the sky, called them by name, bends his ear to his people, listens to our cries of hope, our cries of help, our cries of desire. And as I feel you settle now, Father, in this room, I ask that you would settle our hearts before you. That we may freely worship you. That we may freely praise you. That we may freely engage with you. For that's how you made us, is in relationship. And in that relationship, we desire just to glorify you. Thank you for being our king. We bow our hearts before you. We bow our heads before you. And we acknowledge that you are Lord. And that there is no other name above the name of Jesus. And it's in that name we pray. Amen.
the scripture uh, recently, in 1 Peter 2, where it talks about Christ being the chief cornerstone. And it was so funny, I was going with my small group through that scripture, and there are so many songs that are based off of that one chapter. We just started singing a bunch of the different ones, reciting the lyrics. And it gave me just a piece about what we do if we have Christ as the cornerstone, you know, that's the one that you build everything else off of. And everything I do when it comes to ministry or worship is with the prayer and the hope and, and all of my understanding of scripture, making sure that it's built on what Jesus Christ did, that he died and rose again, that he set us free, that he forgives us and is even now sustaining us supernaturally in spiritual ways, defending us, fighting our battles. And the, the next two songs express a desire for God that is so real and genuine, a desire to build our lives on him and a desire to worship him truly in the way that he wants it. Because God is not impressed by the things we're impressed by. God's looking at the inside of us, at what our hearts are doing. And so my goal for the next two songs is to worship him with complete abandon to give him the best of praise as I understand it, to, to truly express my desire to build my life on him and consider it an invitation for you to do the same, to take this time, whether it's through singing or prayer or just seeking God in the ways that you know, to center our lives on the truth of the gospel of Jesus, that our savior came for us and that he lives again having conquered death and sin. Let's build one another up. Let's be built on the cornerstone of Jesus as we worship him tonight. Worthy of every song we could ever sing we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say We live for you, we live for you, and holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show
all have burdens. We all have sins. We all have weakness that we cannot fix. But you designed us for dependence and you love to meet our needs. You love when we come to you. So tonight, would you help us to see what worship is in a new way for us as individuals, for us as a church. Help us to explore what it means to adore you and to be in a place where your glory is, where your presence is. Would you be glorified as we live out our obedience in a simple song? We give you this, our worship in Jesus' name.
about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. It's everything that we believe. There was a chorus in the last song that says, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And it goes on to say, I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. In my B.C. days, my before Christ days, I knew about Jesus. I had heard the stories, knew what they meant. But the trust was here, not here. And to build on a firm foundation, on to make that trust, it has got to move into our hearts where we say it is all about you, Jesus. Not just what my brain thinks. Because my brain will mess me up every time. But my heart, my heart says I love you and I trust you. And it's all about you. Everything from every breath I take in the morning to the people I interact with during the day, to what I do with my money, to what I do with my time, to what I do with my talent, it's all about you, Jesus. I trust you, and I love you. And it took a near disaster in my life, in my marriage, for me to realize that what I had in my head had not gone to my heart. And maybe tonight, that's exactly where you're at. That I have this great knowledge in my head. But I've never let the foundation come to my heart. I've never let the love fill my heart. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. Here at Stone Ridge, we believe that Part of our worship service is the acknowledgement of our giving. And whether you give online or in the boxes in the back or anywhere else, however you give, it's all about you, Jesus. And we do it cheerfully and gladfully and thankfully because it's all about you, Jesus. So would you bow your heads with me as we enter into this time? (laughs) Lord, you did it again. You just shook my heart up with the worship tonight. As James Bond would say, I was shaken, not just stirred. I was moved. I was reminded of a time, Father, when I did not know you. And now I know you. And I thank you for that. And Father, as we give, as we give financially, as we give in time and in talent, as we give emotionally, Father, We give because we love you and we are grateful. And you give us that opportunity. And so, Father, we just thank you for that. And ask that as we give, you would teach us to give more in generosity. But bless what we do give. In only the way, the only ways that you can. Because... Only you are the perfect giver. So we thank you, Father. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
We continue our series on fingerprints. And so we are into the fourth fingerprint. I'm not sure which, which one it is. Maybe it's the whole hand because it's all about generosity. So our fingerprints, we begin our fingerprint series. Actually, we begin it last week. We continue our series on, with the fingerprint of generosity. And one of the things we want to share about that is that you, you saw a card uh, on your chair this evening as you came in. For probably the last, oh, I would say three years, I have seen the craziest challenges on the internet. I saw the ice challenge where they would dump a bucket of, of ice water over you and then challenge other people to do it and say, here, give money. Then I saw the teenagers who were saying, hey, do a, do a, a teaspoonful of or a tablespoonful of, of cinnamon. And I'm thinking, what a waste of cinnamon. Give it to me, I'll put it in my cinnamon rolls. I'm watching you, these people are just choking on this stuff. And then I heard about the pod, cha the, the Tide Pod Challenge, which to me is just gross. But let us challenge you tonight with a real challenge. It's called the Matthew 25 Challenge. And tonight, Pastor Tom is going to be talking about Matthew 25. But the challenge is really about, can you walk for a week in somebody else's shoes? Can you step in to somebody that you don't know and experience a little bit of their life as we live in this abundant nation. Before I tell you more about that, please watch this video. Then the king would say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous would answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invited you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? King will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The Matthew 25 challenge was a transformational moment for my family and I. There's one particular day when the challenge was to sleep on the floor. And I walked by my daughter's room, and she was already there on her sleeping bag reading her Bible. The Matthew 25 challenge was an incredibly spiritual experience for me personally. God was teaching us different things every day and sharing it with each other was really exciting. Well, when it came to the Water Day challenge, three words come to mind, caffeine, withdrawal, headaches. Going without coffee all day was a lot harder than I thought. I would get these headaches, but every time I did, it would remind me of the six kilometer walk that women and children have to do to get unclean water. My first thought was, this will be easy. I grew up missing meals and sleeping on the floor, but my daughters, not so much. They were challenged to come out of their Wi-Fi life and actually experience what kids around the world experience every single day. So in partnership with World Vision, we have accepted the Matthew 25 challenge. And on your, on your uh, seat, there was a card like this, that if you are interested in taking the challenge, we would love for you to do that. Now, I want you to understand, I had a, I've had a discussion with people that said, sleep on the floor? You've got to be nuts. Do you know how hard it is for me to get out of bed, much, up, much less up off the floor? And I thought about that, and I thought, Okay, so what if you did something differently? Maybe you don't sleep on the floor, but you make your bedtime experience something that's uncomfortable. Or if you can't give up a meal, how do you make that time uncomfortable? How do we actually walk through? Because even though we live in a country of luxury, 
most of the world doesn't. And they still sleep on the floor. And they still, and even though their body is used to it, they still have to deal with the things that many of us in the United States don't have to deal with. And we want to walk a week in their shoes. And so if, if you'll text the word, if you'll pull out your phone, you can text SRC to 56170. You will also find that on your card. Every day it will give you a verse, it'll give you a devotional, it'll give you a video about the challenge. And so starting on Monday, Monday, it asks you to skip your lunch and then only have rice and beans for dinner. Then on Tuesday, it says to drink only water. I think that's where the gentleman said, can you say Kathleen, caffeine withdrawal uh, headache? Wednesday was sleep on the floor tonight. Thursday, wear the same clothes that you wore the day before. For there's many people who are lucky to have one set of clothes. Well, we have many. Friday, Friday then, is to, is to reach out with some, to somebody who's going through a difficult time. And then Saturday is just to spend 30 minutes in prayer. And this Matthew 25 challenge sets us up for the weeks coming up. What you'll see when you, get, when you do the text challenge is you will get a, a, a message like this that says, day one challenge for I was hungry, gave me something to eat. It'll give you a daily challenge, the video story, and a devo and prayer. Even if you do not physically feel like you can do the physical challenge, consider doing the devotional and the video as we as a church step into what it means to walk as other people walk in Matthew 25. So with that, I'm going to let you take over from there. The Matthew 25 challenge is a precursor to something that's happening next weekend uh, that I'm kind of excited about. It's called Chosen. And it's it's a culmination of this partnership with World Vision. Uh, They, during this season... They reevaluated some things in their, in their ministry, and they said, you know, one of the things that we think is really important is to give dignity to these people, these, these people who are often poor that we serve, and they recognized that having a bunch of children have their ta- pictures taken and then wait in, in the dark, essentially, wondering, will I, get, will I get picked or not? Will I get a sponsor or not? was lacked a little dignity for them. And so they decided to flip things around and say, we're going to go to our, our partners in countries like America, and we're going to say, if you're willing to sponsor a child, let us take your picture. We're going to email those to the mission field, and we're going to have a party, and we're going to invite the exact amount of kids that we have pictures, and those kids are going to pick their sponsor rather than have the sponsor pick the kid. And uh, they found some incredible results, uh, just a great, a great celebration in that. And so we're excited to be a part of that kind of new pattern. Um, it's something that we're going we're gonna to be uh, launching next weekend. And so this is, this is all part, to me, of the opportunity to explore just one practical expression of generosity. And there are no end of ways that we can express generosity, and this may or may not be the one that, that uh, or be a one that you feel God calling you into, but I think we can all celebrate uh, any time a kid gets, gets a hand up like this. I think we can all celebrate that together. Uh, generosity is by default giving above and beyond expectations, and that has uh, to do with a little bit with context and a little bit with perspective. Um, let, me, let me give you the, the context part of that. This is really about the expectations part. But uh, have you ever gone to your doctor and seen a tip jar on the counter? That sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Or just said, you know, hey, I got this bill for my doctor. I think I'll just write in an extra tip and, and I'll send him an extra 15 bucks. Nobody would do that. Because there's no expectation in our culture. We all, we all say, well, doctors make plenty of money anyway. And so there's no expectation in our culture to, to add money to what we're giving to our medical professionals. 
And this, the context of giving, there has to be an expectation for their, and, and it has to be above that expectation for there to be generosity. So, for example, if you're going out to eat and you get reasonably good service and you give a 10 or 15 or whatever percent tip, I don't know that most of us, I certainly wouldn't call that, it's, it's good to give a tip, but it's kind of meeting the expectations, not going above and beyond. I wouldn't call that a generous tip, it's just a normal tip. But if you decided, and I saw this, I saw this movement a while back, I, I haven't heard about it lately, but there was a, a movement a while back, I think Butch, you turned me on to it, it was tip your bill, wasn't it? And it was go in, ha have a meal at a restaurant, and then write in on the tip thing the same amount that your bill is, and just be a blessing to your weight person. That's generosity, especially depending on where you eat. Um, so context, the context that you're in really affects our view of generosity, but so does perspective. If I give my friend a $1,000 birthday gift, you would probably say, wow, that's crazy generous, and let me tell you when my birthday is. But if my friend was really disappointed in the $1,000 birthday gift, you would probably think, what a jerk. I mean, they got a $1,000 birthday gift. But what you don't know is that for the previous five years, I gave them a $5,000 birthday gift. And so they got the $1,000 birthday gift, and they thought, oh, I was, I was kind of expecting something different. For the record, I have never given a $1,000 or a $5,000 birthday gift. Don't count on it. Um, but our perspective, the perspective of the giver or the receiver or the person observing generosity, it, it, it matters to how we would define generosity. And what also matters is what we're talking about because generosity is so much more than just money. You can be generous with your time, with your attention, with your uh, forgiveness. You can be generous with compassion. There's, there's any number of ways that you can be generous. It's so much more than Money, it's just what we're giving, what we're sacrificing for another's benefit. And we see that modeled by Jesus. Jesus modeled generosity, but Jesus didn't have a lot of financial resources on his own. So what we see in the life of Jesus is generosity with his time, generosity with his attention, generosity with forgiveness. We're all recipients of that. See, Jesus stopped to give individual attention to people that a Jewish rabbi would not normally associate with. He would normally avoid someone like a Roman soldier. A Jewish rabbi and a Roman soldier had very little to do with each other. A rabbi would not assume a Roman soldier to be even interested in what he would have to say, and certainly a Roman soldier wouldn't come and be asking favors from a Jewish rabbi, except it happened. And Jesus stopped and gave him time and attention and served his need. Jesus encountered a tax collector, a little short little dude named Zacchaeus, who had to actually climb a tree to see Jesus above the crowd. And Jesus saw him, gave him his attention, and even said, you know what? I'm going to go to your house today for dinner and, and sat down, shared a meal with him. Now, a tax collector was like a certified extortionist. They were given a quota of taxes they had to collect and then whatever they wanted to collect above and beyond the quota was their salary. It wasn't set. It's kind of op kind of open-ended. And tax no collectors were notorious for ripping off their communities because they didn't have a lot of guidelines they had to work with. And so Zacchaeus after having a conversation with Jesus decided to repay everyone he had defrauded and give much of his wealth away. Because Jesus was generous with his time and attention. There was a woman that Jesus encountered at a well. She was not Jewish. She was Samaritan. She had a dicey reputation. And instead of doing what any good Jewish rabbi would do and just kind of like shunning her, Jesus stopped and engaged and had a conversation with her. And talked to her about what God really wanted for her in her life. See, Jesus gave time and attention to 
Roman soldiers, tax collectors, this woman at the well, prostitutes and partiers. He was generous in his way. He was also forgiven, forgiving beyond, above and beyond all expectation. That he would absorb in, his, in himself responsibility for our sins. And I don't know, when you think about this, have you ever uh, said or, or been around someone who said, oh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they let a careless word slip out and they're like, oh, God's going to get me for that one. You ever heard that? Yeah, God, like God's going to get me for that one? Let me see hands. I actually want to see hands. Or something of that sentiment. I was thinking about that and I said, actually, that's, that's not true. It's more like, well, Jesus is going to get it for that one. It's not a, a cute little moment where, oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a, little, a little nudge from God on that one. No, Jesus is going to take that one too because he was generous with his forgiveness. He's going he's to take that one too on himself so you don't bear responsibility for it. Jesus modeled generosity. He also taught it. He taught it in Luke chapter 6. He said, bless those who curse you. He said, someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. He said, if somebody asks for your shirt, give them your coat too. Uh, he said, uh, give things away and, and if they take it and don't repay it, then just let it go. He said, love your enemies, lend without expectation. Don't judge people and forgive freely. All in this little section of Luke chapter 6 and Luke chapter 12. He, he challenged people, sell what you have and give it to the poor and store up for yourselves treasures in heaven because where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. In Matthew chapter 10, this is really uh, convicting for me. He said, give as freely as you have received. Oh, dang. <laughs> How freely has God given to you? How extravagantly has God given to you? And he said, Jesus challenged us, give as freely as you have received. Mm. But I want to focus on one specific passage. It was the one that was read on the video, and you're going to have to suffer through hearing it again. I don't think it's, it's the words of Jesus, so it's not that big of a suffering. But it's Matthew chapter 25. That's where we get this Matthew 25 challenge from. And it starts, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he'll separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Place the sheep at his right hand, the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And these righteous ones will reply. Now, I got to pause here. Do you notice how that kind of progresses? I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Those are simple, right? Those are simple, easy things to do. Just, that's, that's just, that's just a, kind of a, an exchange of resources. Doesn't take a lot from you, but it was a nice thing to do. But then all of a sudden he ups the ante. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I'll be honest, I don't invite a lot of strangers into my home. I usually like to get to know you first. But he's, he's making a point here that there's some simple things we can do, but then we can extend ourselves a little further. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. Let's be honest. If you see a naked person, most of us don't stop and give them clothing. Most of us lock the door. Most of us are like, ooh. That person, like, we're on the phone with 911. There's a naked guy in my neighborhood. There's a naked guy running around the parking lot. Do something about it. 
Because there's a fear in us with strangers and naked people. And he ups the ante again, honestly. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. It ups the ante again because sometimes we're afraid that if we care for a sick person, we'll get sick ourselves. If we go to prison, what, what will people think of me if they see me driving into or out of the prison? Can assault our pride a little bit. There's all this wrapped up in this statement that Jesus says. And then he, he goes in, completes the story with the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? I think I would remember that one. When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. It's fascinating to me. Jesus tells the story like this. These are the kind of stories that sometimes in the Bible my wife gets frustrated by because they say something and then they say it again. And then if you go on, he, he has the same exchange with the goats. He's saying this to the sheep. And then he said to the goats, you're in trouble and he said, for I was hungry and you didn't give me something to eat and I was thirsty and you didn't give me something to drink. And he goes through this whole same list and then he goes through it again when those people say, wait a minute, when did we see you that and this and that and this? And so he, in the context of just this one story, he repeats that list four times. You think that was an accident? It's making a point. This is really important stuff. How we choose to extend ourselves is really important stuff in following Jesus. It's not just about you getting your sins forgiven from God and great, it's a party for you. It's a party that's meant to be shared. That's meant to extend yourself to others. See, we give to honor the giver. We give so that we can reflect the character of God, that we can display his fingerprint on our lives. We give to honor the giver. And I, sometimes that starts with a want to or an ought to, and I don't think it really matters which one, honestly. I know that the scripture says that God loves a cheerful giver, and so the want to is a great thing. God really likes that. But I also know that the scripture says that God appreciates it when we choose to just be obedient to the things he's called us to do. And the bottom line is when you start to give like God gives, when you start to express generosity and display that fingerprint of God on your life, it is a transforming experience. And if you don't feel the times that you've given that it's been a transforming experience, I would suggest that you're probably doing it wrong. Let me show you what giving like Jesus gives looks like it's without regard for worthiness if all of your giving is conditional on well you need to be worthy of this gift before i'm going to give it to you then you're doing it wrong in fact that's part of the power in some ways of things like the the tip your bill challenge because sometimes you can tip your bill to a wait person that didn't deserve it, that didn't treat you that well. And when they receive it, and, they're, and they come back to your table and think, I, I think you made a mistake. You, you just wrote the, the amount of the bill in here. And you turn around and say, no, I just really wanted to do something nice for you today. I hope you have a blessed day. You might get someone that just stops and says, but wait a minute, I've been a jerk to you. I've been impatient with you, or I haven't really given you the attention that would deserve a tip like this. And you're like, that's okay. I think that's how God blesses people. Just presents an opportunity. And I'll tell you what, the more we give without regard for worthiness, the more we experience what God experiences when he gives to us. 
Now there is a, there's a principle in Scripture called stewardship. And there's, there's a time to, to draw boundaries and limits and say, you know what? Uh, I don't think this is a good investment or I don't think this is a good place. But when we're talking about personal one-on-one generosity of our time, particularly of compassion and forgiveness and attention, shouldn't be tied to worthiness. So that's one way to have a transformative giving experience is to give without regard for worthiness. Here's another one, to give above and beyond expectation. When someone comes to you and says, you know, something rude. To forgive them, not because they ask you, to forgive them before they ever ask you. Because they may never ask you for forgiveness. But to offer forgiveness before it's even asked for is above and beyond expectation. To offer compassion to someone, as Jesus said, to love your enemies, to bless those who curse you and do kind things to those who persecute you, to to return goodness and kindness for harshness. That's generosity in our compassion. And you will find it giving life to your soul. It transforms not just the people you're giving to, but it transforms yourself. And then I would say to give in a way that honors the giver would be to give in every conceivable way. I said time, talent, treasure, attention, compassion, forgiveness. But that's just the beginning. There's no end to the ways that we can express the generosity of God. And I'll tell you, my deep hope for this series, for this month, is that generosity would become something actually less complicated for us, something simple. Something that just says, you know what? I want to be generous because God's generous with me. That's it. It's that simple. And I hope there is this stirring in our hearts to be more generous people. I've had a, I've had a desire ever since uh, I took on the lead pastor role here several years ago. I've had a desire to see the church grow in generosity. See, not everybody knows this, but we give, of what is given to the church, we turn around and we give 10% of that out to missions, projects, and organizations, and things like Crossroads Mission. And So some things that are local, but some things that are regional or international. And so we're always, we're always turning around 10%. And years ago, I had this thought, like, why, why shouldn't the church grow in generosity? And I even said it once or twice in a sermon, like, that someday we would bump that up in, uh, to 11%, and then someday to 12%, and someday to 13%. And in my head, the, the ultimate goal, the beautiful goal would be that every time we spend a dollar at Stone Ridge, we're also spending a dollar somewhere outside of Stone Ridge. And I'll be honest, I I forgot about that. It was something I thought about. I thought it was a really engaging idea, and then and then life got in the way, and I forgot about it. And then I was preparing the, for the series again, and it just brought it all back up to me. Why can't we as a church family grow in generosity? So I promise you, when we get to budget time, which is a few months away, but when we get to budget time, I will bring it back up to the elders. And I will say, hey, guys, what do you think about growing in our own generosity and see where the elders want us to land in maybe progressively year by year extending our generosity as a church? Because I firmly believe we, we won't regret what we give generously. We'll only regret what we hoard selfishly. (laughs) And I want to be a person and I want to be in a church that sacrificially 
gives in transforming ways. And I, and I hope that that's what's in your heart. I, I have always complimented Stone Ridge as already a generous church. But I don't think we have to stop there. I think we can become a church that is generous above and beyond and carry the fingerprint of God in that way. Let's pray. Father, make it simple in our hearts. to just want to give. And if we don't want to give yet, I pray that you'll help us to be obedient to give and that that obedience would create the want to. And there would be a cycle of obedience and desire that would grow and grow and grow. And I pray, Lord, that we would see incredible fruit in your kingdom people's needs being met, of their hunger being met, their thirst being met, their need for companionship met, their need for clothing and shelter met, their need for healing met. Lord, I pray that it would transform this church, but it would also transform our community as they experience the generosity, your generosity, through your people. It's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen. Thank you, Tom. As with all of our fingerprints, there is the generosity challenge card. You can find this out in the lobby. One of my favorite, I'm going to do a shameless plug here. One of my favorites on this is called the 40 Acts uh, Challenge. And it's 40 days of a devotional with every day having a different act of generosity that you, you participate in. Uh, my wife and I did this as a devotional together, and it is, it is absolutely fantastic. It'll challenge you on a number of fronts. So uh, consider picking up a generosity project card. You can find those in the lobby on the wall. Also, if communion is part of your worship experience, we have communion over here under the cross. Uh, please, please take time to do that. Tom and I will be around if there was something that has pushed your buttons today, whether it is about the, gen- the uh, Matthew 25 challenge, the generosity projects, or just I want to talk about accepting Jesus. We both will be around in the different areas. Please stop by, say hi, and, and let's have a conversation. So God bless. It is a great day. It is still sunny outside. So go enjoy. Have a great week. We'll see you right back here next week at Stonebridge Church.